Essentials of Health Information Management, Principles and Practices, 2nd Edition, Chapter 7, Numbering and Filing Systems, and Record Storage and Circulation. This presentation is going to be over Chapter 7, which is going to be a very important chapter, it's just like Chapter 6 was, a very core chapter for health information uh, management. So we're going to go ahead and get started. The first thing we want to look at um, is that of numbering systems. Um, as a health information management uh, professional, or soon to be professional, we, we need to know a lot about numbering systems. A lot of things that we're going to discuss in this chapter have a lot to do with our responsibility for making sure that the records are accessible um, to authorized individuals as well as secure. And so we're going to talk about different controls um, that we do that we use in order to do that. One of those being um, using numbering systems. Most of your healthcare facilities are going to use some type of numbering system. Uh, you got three common types here, your serial your unit and your serial unit numbering system. And when we're talking about numbering systems, we're looking at how the facility goes about assigning medical record numbers or assigning numbers to patient records. There are advantages and disadvantages to each type of uh, record numbering system. Any of your numbering systems We'll use what we call a master patient index because we use the master patient index to help locate the patient record. When you have numbering systems, there's no way to determine which patient belongs with which number, and that's what your master patient index helps you to do. Table 7-1 in your textbook on page 207 gives you your different advantages and disadvantages to each type of numbering system. The first one we're going to look at is serial numbering system. The serial numbering system uh, will assign a number each time that patient is admitted to that facility. All right. With a numbering system such as this, every time that patient comes in, or if that patient has had multiple admissions, that patient will also have multiple numbers. And right off, you can probably see a disadvantage to that in the fact that you will have records potentially everywhere, all over the place, uh, um, the patient's information in multiple locations in a facility. All right? And it, it really causes a lot of kinks and complications in uh, a facility trying to locate all the previously assigned numbers. So that will be uh, somewhat of a disadvantage. Your unit numbering system uh, is what Joint Commission usually will recommend, and that's where and that's one of your most common. And with the unit numbering system, um, the patient is assigned a medical record number, a patient number when they first are admitted to the hospital, and any other times that they are admitted, they will keep that same number so they don't change. So once you're assigned a number, that's your number for any and all subsequent visits to that facility. With that type of numbering system, all your information uh, will be pretty much located in the same place. Okay? Um, sometimes with the unit numbering system, what you may see um, is they that the patient keep the same medical record number. However, they have different patient account numbers, which is more relatable to the billing department for each admission. So say you may have, uh, the patient may have record number one, two, three, four, five, and then they may have two or three different patient account numbers other than medical record number that indicate different admissions. So this is some, some type of unit numbering system. Uh, some people call it a serial unit numbering system, um, but it's not quite the same thing. So it's really a a some it's really a I don't know what you want to call it, 
uh, it is a some type of I guess you could say unit numbering system. All right. Um, the next type would be a serial unit numbering system, and people use this. Our facilities often use this to to try to make up for if they're not using unit numbering, they try to do a serial unit to be in compliance with joint commission. And your serial unit works in which that patient gets a new number every time they are admitted to that facility. But then once they say they get uh, the number of the first admission and they come to a second admission, then this, the uh, second number is, then the old number is moved to the new number. All right? So basically what's happening is, say if that patient has come up with times, every time that patient comes, all the old numbers have to move forward to the new number. And that, that, that has a lot of work for someone in the master patient index. You will have to continuously keep updating your master patient index with that new number. That will be an, a disadvantage. But you can look at all the disadvantages and advantages as a whole in Table 7-1. Um, another type, um, there are a couple other type numbering systems you may see. Uh, family numbering system is one which you're going to more and likely see that in a type of facility that treats the whole family. And what you have is a core record number that the whole family is assigned. And then you will have modifiers appended to each of those core numbers. So for example, the father, the core number for the family is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The father will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, dash 0, 1 or decimal zero one and the mom one two three four five dash zero two and then first child one two three four five dash zero three and so forth. So again you're gonna see this numbering system typically in a facility that treats the whole family. Um, where you will see your major disadvantage is when there are a, a change when there's a change in the composition of a family, then the uh, Numbering system for that has been assigned to that family has to be changed. Say they get a divorce, children leave the household, different things like that. Um, the, you also have, you may see social security numbering. You shouldn't see that very often these days due to um, one of the major disadvantages to that is to identity theft that's very prevalent today. But um, they used to see it more in the past where they use social security numbers as the medical record number. Your veterans affairs systems use your social security number. Something that may occur here is patients that don't have a social security number, then they have to create a pseudo number for that um, patient. And your book kind of explains to you how that's done. And you can take a look at that. And we'll probably talk about it a little later. So all down here are um, several numbering systems that a facility may use or you may see used out in the field. And again, this is a method or, or something that is used to help assist us in ac accessing information or accessing records as well as other uh, authorized individuals being able to access uh, records. Now, along with your numbering system, we have several types of filing systems that may be used. And your filing systems are either going to be alphabetic or numeric uh, filing systems. One thing about alphabetic filing systems, you don't need to use a master patient index to uh, locate records because they are um, assigned name, the patient's name, so there's no need to go to a master patient index to locate anything. So once you have a patient name, you can locate the record, which is the opposite of when you have numeric filing, you're going to need some method of locating those records via hence the uh, master patient index. Okay, so with the alphabetic file system like we talked about, you, you're going to use the patient's name. And usually it's filed by patient's last name, uh, first name, then middle. Okay? And it kind of depends on what your facility exactly the uh, rules of how to do that. So there's no universal rule in terms of alphabetically filing by patient's name. 
In your textbook, they use uh, what they call uh, the Association of Records Managers and Administration Guidelines, ARMA, as to how you need to file alphabetically the patient's name. And there's a couple of things that they mention here. Um, they tell you the last name, then the first name, then the middle name. Uh, it says if patients use an initial instead of their given name, file according to the initial. They also tell you to disregard any punctuation. So if you have hyphenated names or names that have the little accent marks, you're going to disregard that in terms of filing by name. So you just close that gap up and act like that's not even there. All right. Prefixes include a qualification last name or file alphabetically. All right. And it says tells you about the use of names with MAC, M A C or MAC, M C. Maybe uh, file is the same. It just again it's going to depend on um, your facility policies and procedures. Whether you're going to file with professional and religious titles. It, you know, some facilities allow that, some do not. When you're going to do your alphabetic filing uh, assignment for this class, you're going to follow the rules here in the textbook. Um, then it tells you if you have um, two patients' names that are identical, then you may have to file according to date of birth. Who's the oldest, who's the youngest? Uh, if that's identical, you may have to file alphabetical according to address and so forth. Okay. Of course, there are advantages and disadvantages to your different filing systems as well. In terms of alphabetic filing, one of some of the major things, and not, this is not an exhaustive list, exhaustive list, but your alphabetic filing is easy to learn because most people have learned how to file alphabetical uh, in grade school. Um, and so that means there's not going to be that much training needed, um, and records can be pulled quickly. So those are advantages. Disadvantages to this system: um, you have to have the names spelled correctly in order to file them correctly. Uh, so if they're not spelled correctly, that can cause misfiles. Also, the expansion of the files are not even. And what we mean by that is. Um, say, for instance, uh, you, your last name that start with S, like Smith, names like Smith, Williams, they they will uh, they are going to grow faster than maybe say the letter X or the letter Z. And so what you're going to have is your section W is packed and full, where some of your other sections are almost empty. So that's what we mean by they don't expand evenly. And so what that means is then you have to go and keep reorganizing your shells because of that uneven expansion. The other um, disadvantage is if a patient changes their name, maybe they get married, get divorced, or something of that nature, um, then you're going to have to um, change the location for that record. Also, it's easy um, to breach security with alphabetic filing because everybody pretty much knows how to file alphabetical. We just talked about it being easy. Uh, system to learn because everybody has already learned. So someone potentially just off out in the hall can just come in and figure out if they know the patient name, they can find it on your um, filing shelf. So not the best security. All right. Uh, another type of filing system is called Soundex, where they use phonetic spelling in order to file. That means how a name sounds. You may see this used with uh, areas that have a lot of foreign names where it's hard to spell. So you go you will go by uh, sound. The book tells you that this system has been adopted by the US Census Bureau and you can see they come across a lot of foreign names and things of this that that sort. Um, and so again they're gonna go by the phonetic phonetic spelling or how something sounds and so they assign there are uh, code numbers assigned to certain key letters, and when you hear those sounds, you're going to assign those code numbers, and you're going to use the first initial or the last name, and then you're going to use code numbers for some of the other sounds in that name. Um, so your book there on page 211 goes into more detail. We'll probably take more time um, 
looking at this in a later presentation. All right, so you can take a look at that at your own, in your own um, in your own time. Now, from there, you have numeric filing, and you have several several systems that fall under the numeric filing. Straight numeric is one, and straight numeric is similar to in terms of easy to learn. It's similar to your alphabetic file system. Everyone learns how to do num um, numerical order in grade school. So this is exactly what straight numeric filing is. They're going to uh, file in chronological order from lowest to highest. All right? So you got some of your same advantages with the um, straight numeric numbering system uh, in terms as well as alphabetic. Now one thing in terms of advantages um, that's not with alphabetic is that the patient records will be more secure because a person can't just come in with the patient name and find the record. Also, files can be easily expanded to add additional file space at the end of the file. So that's um, totally different than in your alphabetical system. Some of your disadvantages, uh, you have to consider all the digits of the number. Um, and so you have to be very careful with transposition of numbers. That's mean flipping. So you number one, two, three, and you have one, and you see it as one, three, two. That's a transposition. All right. And so that will, as a result, increase your misfile when things like that happen. Um, also, you're going to have like a um, work jam right there where all your new numbers are being created. So that's where all your most activity is going to occur. So everybody's going to be piled up in that section. So that's a disadvantage. So there, that makes your workspace be um, a lot more restricted in those high activity areas, which would be where you are creating the new numbers. Terminal digit filing. This is, and terminal digit and middle digit are similar. It's just it's directing you in how you need to look at the number. A lot of times when I have students who are working with terminal digit file, middle digit filing, they want to flip the actual number, but you're not changing a medical record number itself. You're just looking, it, you're focusing on different areas in term, and determining where it needs to be filed. All right, so with terminal digit filing, um, you're going to see facilities that usually have a six um, digit medical record numbers are longer who uh, most likely use your terminal digit, digit filing system, they you may tend to see them hyphenated. So like one, two, three, four, five, six, you might be one, two, dash, three, four, dash, five, six. That kind of helps with the filing situation when they use the hyphen. Now when we're looking at terminal digit filing, it's telling you that your primary digits are going to be at the end of your number. So in the number one, two, three, four, five, six, when I get ready to file my first um, place that I'm going to pay attention to or, or my first area of the number that's going to be of interest is in the end. So in the number one, two, three, four, five, six, five, six is where I'm going to start in order to start putting my um, numbers in order. Because this is a terminal digit system. The terminal means the end. So five, six is where I'm going to start. Once I put all those in order by the last number, if I have uh, record numbers that multiple record numbers that end in 5-6, then the next place that I'm going to look to continue to um, put these in order is in my secondary digits, which is in the middle of the number. So in my number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3, 4 will be my secondary digits. If I have multiple medical record numbers that have both 3, 4 as a secondary digit and 5, 6 as a terminal digit, then the last place I'm going to look is in my tertiary digits, and in a terminal digit filing system, that's going to be the first or the beginning of my medical record number. That will be in my 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2 will be my tertiary number. So in that medical record number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 5, 6 is where I look first, which is my primary, and 3, 4 is my secondary, I look there second. And 1, 2, which is at the beginning of the number, is my tertiary digits, and that's where I look last if necessary. Your book on page 213 gives you a good example on how you need to do terminal digit filing. All right? Now, your middle digit 
is similar to that, but with middle digit, I'm not going to look at the terminal end first. I'm going to look at the middle first. So in my um, number, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six that we were looking at earlier or considering earlier, I'm going to look at three, four. That's going to be my primary. That's the middle. The middle digit is my primary. So three, four is where I'm going to start first. So I'm going to put all my records in order. And then if I have multiple numbers that um, have three, four as their primary digits, which are the middle digits, then I'm going to go to the digits on the left, which is the beginning of my number. That's going to be my secondary digits in a middle digit filing system. In one, two, three, four, five, six, I mean one, two. So one, two is going to be my secondary. All right. If I have multiple medical record numbers that has three, four as my primary, which was in the middle, and one, two is their secondary, which is in the beginning, then I need to consider my tertiary digit, which is the digit to the right of the middle, that's my last number, that's five, six. All right, so that's where I would go next. So in middle digit, you go to the middle first, then you go to the beginning of the number, then you go to the end in order to uh, put your numbers in order. You also look at these in terms of maybe you might be just putting records in order at your desk, but you may also be trying to file in a terminal digit filing system on shelving. And so basically you're saying the middle digit is where uh, is the file uh, section. Or the, um, another way you can say that is um, yeah, the file section. So that uh, in the middle digit, the 3, 4 would be my file section. Then my subsection would be the first set of numbers, which is 1, 2. All right. And then I identify the record location on that shelf, which is my tertiary, which will be five, six. All right. And the same thing applies to the terminal digit. Is what how you're looking at the number. You're not changing the number in any way. It's where you're gonna focus your attention first, then second, then third to put those medical record numbers in order. Now in terms of advantages and disadvantages, the terminal and the middle are gonna be pretty similar. First of all, one of your major advantages to this type of numbering system is that it's uh, very good with security. Even if a individual knows the patient, uh, patient's name, can somehow figure out what the patient's medical record number is, most people will find it hard to locate it on the shelf with a terminal or middle digit file system because that's simply not how people usually think. Even uh, HRM professionals who are working in the department sometimes get a little uh, confused and com discombobulated with this type of system. You just get, kind of have to get used to using it. Um, another advantage is that the files expand evenly in these type of systems. Um, you don't have a lot of, of um, compilation of workers in one spot, so it eliminates congestion. Um, when you're getting ready to plan to see how much filing equipment you need, it simplifies the planning for that. Missed files are reduced. Gaps in the files won't occur. Transposition of digits are less frequent. Um, and inactive records can be easily retrieved in these type of systems. Disadvantages is that you're going to have to have um, some significant training that has to go into this because, again, like I said, it's not the way a person would normally think. Um, initially, more space and equipment would be needed to organize the filing area. Um, and you have to have good organization um, when you get ready uh, to expand your file. All right. Now, like I said, your middle digit has and your terminal digit has similar advantages and disadvantages. Um, but with your middle digit, it has an additional disadvantage um, in that your patient medical record numbers should not exceed six digits um, with the um, middle digit filing system. It's just when you're doing that type of system, it's going to be easier 
um, to work with with six digits. So you usually have some some of your smaller type facilities who probably will go with the middle digit filing system. Now another thing you need to look at in, outside of your numbering system, your filing system, and in terms of filing system, there are several ways that you can do um, your filing system, and that is uh, what I'm talking about. Is either you're doing it, uh, organizing, organizing it in a centralized type of uh, system or decentralized. So when I'm talking about centralized, that means all my records are in the facility um, is stored in one central location. And so people, uh, your employees or what have you, will go to that central location to access um, those files. This makes it easy in terms of the response of the people, uh, the HIM department who has that responsibility of the records, they're all in one spot. All of your equipment is being shared in that location. Um, and your services to everybody who needs those records will be uh, persistent and then there's improved security. Now, some of your disadvantages is say if you have a multiple health system where it has multiple hospitals or what have you, and it's all in one location. It might be sometimes for some areas too remote um, to access them. Um, and what you may have is what we call workarounds, where they start keeping um, their own little record system in their location, um, which is not what we're looking for. Um, you also have to make sure your filing equipment and the staff is appropriate with, uh, when you have a centralized area, may it may it may um, have you needing additional employees in that area to try to make sure everything is working effectively and efficiently, um, as well as your equipment, because you're going to get a lot of uh, routine uh, frequency of it being used because everything is in one location. All right, um, decentralized filing is just the opposite of centralized. That means they may have a, a facility or a health care system or something may have multiple locations in which they uh, store patient records. All right. One thing that's good about that uh, is that where we had those issues with remote locations with centralized, you won't have that problem with decentralized because you can actually put different uh, record storage areas, places near where they're needed. All right. Your main HIM department won't need as much space because you've got these other multiple locations. Um, the providers will have more control over their filing and retrieval of the patient information. Uh, and, and so those are advantages. Some of your disadvantages is that there could be some confusion involved when you've got all these different multiple locations to find patient information. You might see fragmentation because you can have some of the patient information on here. Some may be over there just because of all these locations. And therefore, uh, you also may have problems with providers who will have these records. Maybe they're not maintaining them according to or uh, compliant with whatever our policy and procedures at facility or, or any other um, local, state, or federal laws and regulations that we uh, need to be following. Because they're, that's not what their training is in. So you, you will have to try to ensure that that's being done. Also, just simple lack of uniformity because you got all these different storage areas for your records. Now, what's also important to consider is the filing equipment. So we looked at how you assign numbers to the record, how you're going to store those records in different filing systems, as well as are we going to do it in a centralized location or a decentralized location. Now we need to consider what are we going to store um, these records on. Especially if we're doing paper records, then you're going to be taking up physical space. Um, and you got different types of filing equipment that is that uh, is used. Your book on page 217, table 72, gives you nice pictures as well as descriptions of the different types of filing systems. Your um, facility, usually in, in um, combination with the HIM 
director will will decide, especially if it's a new area, they usually decide on what type of file and equipment is going to be best needed in their facility for the type of needs that they have. Now, an open shelf file, you have an image there, and I also have um, pictures of these. You got your open shelf filing system, and as you can see, um, the shelves are, it's almost like a bookcase is what it looks like. Um, and so you'll just put the files on, on these uh, open shelf files. A lot of times with this type, your records will have the tab on the side where it sticks out. In these type of systems, you got a lateral uh, filing system, and these are all they that you see, and they tend to have like a little door uh, on the front, and you can see that those little doors on the front, um, and um, the door can go up and in up at the top so that you can access the file. We call those um, lateral files. They have retractable doors, is what you call them. Right? And you can lock those on the front. That's a lateral file. Then you got what we call movable files, or you may hear it called compressible files. The little wheels on here, you can roll them and move them and create aisle space in between each of those, depending on which one you need to go in. So it really stays on space, and it has the little wheel there. It's like a hand crank. Um, that will, and you just spin it and it moves the shells up and down a little track, right? And you can have it automated, automated or manual. So the manual kind, you have the little thing wheels and, and your a hand crank or whatever that you move the files with. If it's automated, automated, they can touch a button or something and it moves on a little machine or motor that moves them back and forth. Like I say, they're, they're, these are pretty good on space because you can compress all your files together when they're not in use. Another one here is called a power filing machine. Um, and it, it goes up rather than um, uh, out like we just saw in the compressible. So it will roll up almost like a um, what you what you call your address deck or that little um I don't forgot what you call those things that spin around roller deck I think I was trying to call it roller deck and so basically it just kind of moves up it uses it goes up and down versus uh, horizontal it goes vertical versus horizontal. Now this is an old-fashioned vertical file. Most people are very used to seeing these have been around a long time. Um, and where you just pull out your drawers and your records will be down in there. And with those, if you have, if you're storing records in these types, then your tabs on your folders will be at the top versus on the side. These often can come with um, locks as well. Visible file system, these are um, sort of similar to your vertical files, but they, they, they are visible file system, systems because you can easily view the contents in the drawer. And you see how it opens up wide. Again, here your records will probably have the tabs on the top. All right? Because a lot of times you're going to either see uh, medical records with end tabs or um, top tabs. All right. So those are some of the types of filing equipment that you may see used to store uh, records on. Again, it's based on um, the facility's needs. Also important here um, is with with the types of filing systems that they, a facility may decide they need to use. You have to uh, do. We have you have to calculate the storage need, so you know what, uh, how much space is going to be used, uh, and and what depending on what size of the filing equipment, how much, how many uh, records can be stored on a particular filing system, and so basically the things you need to figure out when you're trying to calculate this type of information uh, is you need to determine how. If, if most facilities will look at their growth, like how much they think they're going to grow because they want to be ahead of that growth spurt and make sure that they have uh, room to store the records. 
And so basically, if uh, a facility has some existing space that they're using, and maybe they think they're, uh, when they project growth in the next couple of years, two years, three years, five years out, whatever their desire, then they need to determine or project or estimate how many inches are they going to need in the future. So we got how many we need now, how many are we going to need in the future. Based on that information, what type of filing equipment are we using, how much space can they store, how much space can an open shelf filing system, say we're using an open shelf filing system and it has seven or eight shelves on it, how many records per, uh, can be stored on that one unit, right? So we need to know how much, how many inches we're growing, how many inches, linear inches can be stored on our filing equipment of our choice, and then we got to uh, convert between how many inches of our records are is going to need and how many we can get on a shelf to determine how many shelving units we'll need. And your book on page 219 goes through an example, and we're going to, um, at, a, at a later date, go through an example of how you go about calculating this. There may be times where you find yourself in this uh, situation as a, a new professional. It just all depends on the type of facility that you are in, but we do have um, with it, a lot of your electronic health record implementation, so it may be less and less common, but you may find yourself in that situation, um, which is more of like a planning um, type function. Now, also important is the file folders themselves that we're storing on these equip on this filing equipment and the numbering we're putting on them and the, the filing systems that we're going to use. We, as an HIM professional, the file folders themselves are also important. Your file folders, um, a lot of them, if they are, if they haven't been discharged yet, the patient record is kept in binders. But once they're discharged, they go to folder. Um, and there are a variety of sizes and weights that we can get those folders in. Um, they can become through vendors. Um, and then if you've got x-rays, they're stored in jackets or envelopes. But when we look at the file folders themselves, let's, at, let's look at some of the options um, that we need to consider. So you can, a facility can use what we call color coding. Color coding is when we assign colors to the patient's record numbers. So like in our example, one, two, three, four, five, six. I may decide uh, that for the number one, I'm going to use the color red, number two, I'm going to use the color yellow, number three, purple, number four, light green, number five, light blue, and number six, dark blue. Now, what we, can, what we do is those numbers are attached using um, stickers or some type of some method they're going to use to append those numbers on the record and they will be color coded, all right? So when I'm attaching that one to my file folder, it's going to be red. And so you're going to have a color pattern is what you're going to get. And because you're going to have a color pattern, when I get ready to file these records on the shelf, all of my medical record numbers that begin with one, two, are going to be red, yellow, red, yellow, red, yellow. So I can stand at the side of my filing uh, equipment on my filing shelf, look down the numbers that begin with one, two, and I should see all red, yellow. If I see red, purple, that automatically lets me know that something has been misfiled. So with your color coding, it helps you to identify misfiles. Alright? Um, and they do color code in different ways. So you can have um, the colors associated with each sticker for your medical record number. Some color, they have different colored file folders to represent different types of patients. Um, all of this is sort of um, used um, or some type of way of using color in order to identify records. Um, you got computer tracking systems that use barcoding, um, which is like the UPC codes you see at a grocery store that they scan, and also to help identify. Um, records. 
Okay, so color, color coding is one consideration. You have an example of that in Figure 7 4 showing you um, about your color code. Um, you also, if you look at Figure 7 5 on 2.22, you see an example of a barcode, a pre printed label there. Okay, now also consideration is when you when you have these documents that are going into this file folder, um, so you're doing assembly, you got to have some type of way to secure that those documents to the folder. So we have what we call these fasteners, right? And so now if we're going to use these fasteners, we have to also consider the the position of those fasteners on our, our file folder. And you have different options uh, as to how you want to do that. Some of them have uh, the, the fasteners with the adhesive strip that you peel off and stick to the folder. You can get folders with the fasteners already attached um, to the folder. You can have some embedded type, heat bonded, docu clip fasteners. And you also can consider where you want them. You can have it on the top, on the side. Um, it can be customizable. If you look on page 222 at the bottom, uh, figure 7 6 shows you your different types of fasteners. And then figure 7 7 shows you that right below figure 7 6 some of the different positions that you can have your uh, fasteners put on your folder. So all that is going to be based on the needs of that facility as to where they want those uh, fasteners positioned and what type of fastener that they wish to use. HIM professionals as well as the facility also have to decide on if they want any pre-printed information uh, on those folders. Um, they want to make sure that they at least include an area where you're going to put the patient's name and their medical record number, the facility's information uh, on those folders. So you, uh, they want to make sure there's a place um, for that. They can put information on the outside, on the inside of the folder. All of this has to be considered. Some other things. Um, you need to look at in terms of the actual folder itself. Um, do we want any reinforcement um, on the folder? When they're re reinforcing the folder, they, they tend to do that when that folder is going to be highly used. Uh, and so they have to find different areas on that folder to make, um, make it a little more rigid so that it can withstand all the usage. Uh, in Figure 7 9, they have errors pointing to different areas where they um, what reinforce that might be used. So right there in that figure um, is showing there at the tip. They're reinforcing that little rounded tip there because maybe that's where it get more use or more pressure, and so it'll hold up a little better um, when you reinforce it. It makes the folders more durable. Sometimes they reinforce along the spine uh, as well. All right. They all, the, your book tells you when a, when the folder is not reinforced, we call it single ply. Right? Point stop is also going to be important. That's talking about how thick that folder is. Um, and so they have different points. You got 14 point, 12 point, um, those types of things. The higher the point, the thicker that, that folder is going to be. Again, you tend to pick those based on usage, how frequently that uh, folder is going to be in rotation. Okay, rounding is another type of thing that we look at. Uh, rounding occurs usually around the top and side tab, so that um, it, it'll help it from being crushed. Because a lot of times your little, those little um, stick out tabs can get bent very easily, and so we'll do um, rounding to help to avoid that. Because your tab is a lot of times where you're going to find. Patient's name and information usually is there, or the medical record number, and those types of things. You can see examples of the tabs there in your figure 7 9, um, those little uh, pips out there on the side. All right, scoring is, a, is something else that can be used. Um, if you look at figure 7 9 at the bottom, you see it looks like a little an accordion there at the bottom of that folder. Scoring will help with expandability of that folder so you can pack more documents in it. So as you're um, putting more and more 
documentation in that in that record, it it can it gets bigger and bigger, and it can contain all that information without tearing up. It's built to handle that expanded capacity. Okay. Now, so after you consider that, some other things we need to look at is file filing controls. Your Joint Commission and your Medicare Conditions of Participation um, both say that we have to be able to retrieve or uh, be able to retrieve those records. They need to be accessible uh, and will need it and when it's uh, um, in timely, right? And so, with that in mind, your facilities um, have to establish policies and procedures on filing controls, right? You may see them using what we call charge out system, right? Where they are controlling the movement of the records in and out of that file area. They want to make sure that they identify who's going to be authorized um, to request those records, how long can they keep them, um, and how are we going to go about transferring them to the needed areas um, in our facility. All right? They have to have policies and procedures on the maintenance and management of those records. All right? This is what we mean by filing controls. So what you'll see them using in order to get this done are a chart tracking systems, file guides, and audits. A chart tracking system is going to help with the retrieval and the tracking of requests for patient records. It you a lot of times a big part of the job that HR professionals do is pulling records based on record requests within the facility. And a lot of times you have a lot of routine requests. You have different departments like your infection control who request records because they're going to do some type of quality uh, reporting or, or, or quality assessment. You may have them doing some utilization reviews at a certain time of the month or quarter, and so they'll send a request, and we pull those records on some type of schedule or system to uh, satisfy those requests. These are planned requisitions. Now, you can also have non-routine requisitions, which are basically emergencies, where these uh, things occur, maybe like in the emergency room or something is going on, and they typically are going to make that request via a telephone call or something, and we immediately deliver retrieve that, that record and deliver it to wherever it needs to be. Um, you can have manual or automatic, automated uh, requisition systems. A uh, requisition form basically is if in a manual sense. If we're doing a manual um, chart tracking system and they use requisition form, it's usually like a three-part form. Um, and when a person is request or a department is requesting some records, they will fill out that requisition uh, form. The original, where the HIM fills out that form, or however their policy and procedure state, but the original, um, we have we usually have a file where we keep the original requisition form, and then one is going to uh, go to the requester with the records that they requested. So it will go with the records themselves to that requester. And then the third one is going to go in to what we call an out guide. You have a picture of a uh, out guide on page 226, figure 712, and you can they can be made out of different types of material. Here you got a vinyl one and a paper out guide. But the basic idea behind your your out guides are that that third part of your requisition form is going to go into your out guide. Your out guides usually have one or two pockets in them, and so one of the pockets is made for that requisition form. And what you're going to do is once you pull that record that has been requested, the out guide is going to go in place of the record on the shelf. So what happens is then when if someone comes in after that record has been sent, um, their requested record has been sent to the requester, if someone else come in, comes in and needs that same record, when you go off to the um, your terminal filing system, you're going to go and you're going to look down there the file, and when you get to the spot where that file should be sitting, you're going to see the out guide. You can pull the out guide, see where that record is uh, in your facility. So 
So this is why we call it file control. So now I am in control of where my records are. An HR professional needs to always know where the records are located at all times. So the out guide helps do that. So you will have a pocket for um, your third portion of your uh, record requisition, rec requisition form. And there's another pocket that's usually there for your loose um, filing. Um, and I think I'm going to talk about loose filing and uh, well, I'll go ahead and talk about it now. So that second pocket, you got one pocket for your requisition form. The second pocket is for loose filing. Loose filing is individual documents and reports um, that belong in a patient's record, but they are not secured in that record as, at that time. So most of the time what you're looking for, what you want to happen is when the patient is discharged and then we come and we pull that record off of the nursing floor, it's now it's become our property, everything needs to be in that record. But if that's not the case, and a lot of times that's not the case, there may be some labs that come after the record, after the patient's been discharged and we have the record, it may be other sheets that didn't get in there for whatever reason. So when that stuff comes to the HIN department, this is what we call loose filing. So that second pocket on the out guide will, uh, is where a HIN professional can put in loose file uh, documents that may come in that need to be appended to that record or stuck in that record. Okay? So when that record comes back, you can put drop that information on in those documents that need to um, make the record complete and go on in there. That needs to be done as quick as possible. And you don't want to linger on loose files because loose filing can get out of hand uh, very quickly. You don't want a lot of loose filing because what that means is you got a lot of incomplete records around here with missing documents. So you got fragmented patient information. So that's not a good thing. Okay. All right. So you have your out guide, um, and like I said, you can, it can be made out of different types of material. Um, and so that's more or less your manual tracking system. If a facility is using a automatic automated tracking system, then they pretty much have individuals to go on the computer and fill out a, a screen that's going to probably be similar to your paper. A requisition form in order to request records, and then the HRM department processes those re requests, um, and they can track it, the movement of those on that computer. But that'll eliminate the need for that paper form. A lot of your records used on this type of system, they have a barcode that they'll scan, and then they'll sign the record out to the party who who requested it, and then when it's returned, they go back into the system and update the information. Some facilities may use your automated chart tracking system and the out guides um, together. So it just kind of depends on what the, the facility uh, wants to do. Another mechanism that is used is the audit. Right? They want to come in periodically and audit the file area. And the frequency of this is going to depend on the size of your facility and the needs of the facility. Um, when they are auditing on the file area, they are making sure or reviewing for missed files and then for records that weren't returned that was requested. All right, and this is important. This is going to work toward us always knowing where our record is uh, in the facility uh, file controls, basically. I'm also checking for out guys that are in the file area that do, do not need to be there anymore. Uh, if a per individual in the HIM department is not on top of those types of things. Uh, a another department area, another employee who has requested that record, a record requester brings that record back, and you don't pull the out guide. So now it looks like, and you lay the record down, it looks like that person still has the record. Yet it, the record is in the department. So these are the type of things we don't want to occur because then when somebody wants to access that record and we don't have a true picture of where that record is, this is not file control. All right? The good thing about an automated chart tracking system is that it can produce reports. And so you can pull up reports that list all records that haven't been returned and we try to go in there and find those records in the facility. 
And so the reporting mechanism itself is great um, when you have an automated um, system. Because if you don't have that, then it's just going to consist of the HIM professional going in there and, and going around the department looking um, in that air, five areas for out guys and reconciling requisition slips and outstanding records. All right, so that's your five controls. Now, in terms of circulation of the actuaries, how are we going to go about doing those? Um, circulation systems, there are many different types that a facility can use to transport records from one location to another. The most common is hand delivery. I, I go out to the HI department and walk it down here, or, and the uh, individual with question record walks it back, you know, so that's hand delivery, most common. But you can also have uh, mechanical circulation system devices, like a pneumatic tube. It, it, it's, almost, it's like a suction or something that they can put the record uh, and suck it up through the tube uh, in some type of tunnel-like situation to another area. And so the, that tube or that tunnel goes around the whole facility and it can be dropped off in different areas using that pneumatic tube. You have dumb waiter, which is an elevator you stick. I worked in a place where they had the dumb way and you stick the records, maybe you're on the first or second floor, and it needs to go to the fifth floor, and you stick it on the elevator, and it takes it up to the fifth floor. Then you got conveyor belt, um, sort of work like a pneumatic tube, but the records are on um, a belt. It's almost like in a warehouse or something, and the parts are flowing along a little um, motorized belt, so you put the record on that and it's transported to the different areas. You also have your uh, fax machine, so you can circulate patient information via fax. Um, there should be policies and procedures in place at the facility in terms of how uh, fax tr transmissions need to occur. A uh, best practice here that was mentioned in your textbook is when you're faxing patient information, um, Call that the place where you're trying to fax it before and after the fax is sent to confirm. Let them know I'm getting ready to fax this information, and then after you fax it, call them. Did you get the information? Computers is another mechanism for uh, circulating patient information because we got computers and internet, internet, all these types of things um, in which we can circulate, which serves as a device to circulate that information. Okay. All right. Now, the final topic or concept we need to cover is security of the health information. We talked about accessibility. Uh, security is also important. So there are several things we are responsible for as HIM professionals in regards to security of the health information. One of the main things, or the most, one of the most simple things, is making sure those records are secured in a lock file or in a locked room, all right? And only act, uh, only authorized personnel have access to that patient information, okay? Now, also we have to protect the records from fire and water damage, all right? We need to have sprinkler systems placed in the medical records area for fire. Uh, we also want to make sure our records have a top shelf above them to cover them, um, to protect them from water damage. There are also, due to your local fire codes, you have um, regulations in terms of how um, much clearance needs to be on above your record. And here your book tells you there needs to be 18 to 20 inches of clearance between your top shelf and the ceiling. I've been in departments where they have records stacked up on top of the shelves. That's a no-no. That's in violation uh, of your local fire code and, and regulations in terms of the way we need to store our records. So you need to have a clearance above that top shelf in the ceiling. Also, you need to have space in between. There, I think three feet is the uh, requirement for space between aisles. There also needs to be a fire extinguisher in, uh, in the area. We shouldn't put records on the floor. That's against um, regulations as well. 
in terms of authorized personnel accessing those records, and we talked about the locked doors and the locked files. If um, when the when we have those these HIM departments with those records, you, you can't you have to be careful in terms of how uh, we handle the department. Say maybe everybody's going to a meeting or something, then that door needs to be locked. Um, people should be floating in and out, and there's no uh, HIM individual in that department. Everyone in the facility shouldn't have keys. All the employees should not have keys to the medical records department. I like to, to liken it to the HR department that has uh, employee records. No one can just float into HR and start poking about. And so HIM is the same, is, is as secure as an HR um, department. Um, when there, if the HIM department is closed, say evenings or nights, there's no night shift or evening shift, then usually you're going to have someone like your um, the charge nurse or something that will have a key in order to um, access records in case of emergencies. Um, you can have different types of uh, Things that they use in order to determine if someone has access, maybe using swipe cards to get into um, the medical record department. Those are similar to what we use for your room key in a, a hotel. Uh, so basically, you want to make sure um, that we don't have any concerns in terms of breaches to. Um, the security and privacy of that patient information. Also need to be considered in terms of security with all of the technology that has come about with this mobile technology. HIM department as well as administration needs to make sure that there are clear policies and procedures in place for this mobile technology, making sure all the employees understand and train on how these things need to be used. Encryption and password security must be in place, uh, and also how they will go about purging information if, if there's going to be a new user to that uh, new that mobile computer or mobile technology. Your book also talks about when records and patient information is destroyed in natural or uh, man-made disasters. Um, they tell you that the CMS has guidelines in terms of um, how to corroborate that this has occurred and that information um, has been destroyed. CMS has a corroboration process to confirm allegations of record destruction by natural and man-made disasters. Um, and there's two steps here that they talk about, um, qualification being one where the facility turns in a attestation, attestation statement, and then CMS is going to um, determine whether it qualifies for that man-made or natural disaster. And then they're going to confirm the accuracy of that attestation, and um, and that's the accuracy step or stage of the process. Once this is confirmed, then that facility is not going to be liable. Uh, for that information uh, being destroyed due to natural disasters, uh, man-made disasters. Also of importance when we're looking at, and the final thing I need to talk about in terms of security, uh, we have talked about documentation standards and how documentation needs to be treated in terms of making uh, changes and addendums to that information. Well, it's our um, it's up to HIM as well to make sure that information is not being tampered or defaced with based on our, our um, rules and regulations in terms of documentation. Uh, so that is also in our charge um, as well. This is going to include paper and automated type systems because automated systems can have security breaches uh, and different things that can occur um, as well. Even with your automated system, a lot of times that's what we consider in paper, you might have what we call backup systems that are in a separate location um, than the facility to help uh, us not to lose important information, uh, uh, be able to recreate 
um, documents if necessary, if things occur. So all these things have to be pre-thought out um, so that we can maintain security of, and privacy of patient information. This is going to conclude my presentation uh, for Chapter 7.